Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true deep woods horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. You can also submit them on reddit at r slash the dark swamp. Now, let's jump into these creepy and allegedly true deep woods horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. The Guardian of the Forest by Tim H. My name is Tim. I live in Belgium, and since 2005, I have studied specific witchcraft and written books about the subject. To better engage in these subjects, I moved to the country south, where deep forests exist. Little did I know that there was a legend living in these forests when I came to live near the woods. The code of the guardian of these forests. If you have good intentions for the woods or its animals, the guardian will help you to find your way if you lose track. But if you have bad intentions, you may stay in these forests forever. When I came to live here, I absolutely was enthralled with the forest and wanted to have better contact with mother nature. But one day, I lost my way in the endless forest while hiking. It was starting to get dark and I noticed there was no sound at all. At some point, I even slipped and fell on the ice and hurt my leg. My leg was in a lot of pain, and it was freezing. It was a foggy night, and it was a full moon, so luckily I didn't have to use my iPhone with the light on. But I didn't have it with me anyway, even if I wanted to use it, because I didn't even know that I had forgotten it until I got home the next day. The forest was starting to come alive as I saw eyes everywhere, looking at me in the darkness of the woods. There was a point where I thought I wouldn't make it, until I saw that the eyes were looking at me. They were unlike any other. They were like bright red and glowing. It kept me in this trance that just kept me walking forward, step by step. I was in pain and just wanted to get out of the woods at any chance possible. I remembered those sayings when I was younger. My intentions were pure and I knew that I had no intention of hurting anything in the woods. So I was hoping that whatever these eyes were attached to were potentially the forest guardian leading me out of here. Without really realizing it, I arrived at a village in the woods and could completely barely remember how I got out of there. I called my dad to tell him where I was, and on my way back I saw all kinds of animals. Foxes, deer, wild boars, they were all looking at me statically at the edge of the forest. This was my encounter with the animal that I believe was the guardian of the forest. Months later, I came to the village of Bohan, where a statue thoroughly described the creature. I asked a local woman who was standing nearby who made it, and she said that this is the legend of our forest, that there was a man over a hundred years ago who went out and discovered some sort of creature. When he came back, he was in severe shock and died after three days of a heart attack. He said whatever he saw, it could breathe fire in the creature's description that was inscribed on the statue. Strange Discoveries in the Catskills by Mooser Gooser I was hiking in the Catskills. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but I regularly visit the Catskills yearly because sometimes the Poconos get boring. I started at the trailhead parking lot, parked my car, and walked up the same trail I'd stepped up a thousand times before. After about an hour, I started to feel weird. The woods were quieter than they usually were, and when I had come up here before, I had never noticed it being this quiet. I wasn't initially very concerned about it, but then after I sat down for some breakfast, I heard rustling above me and some sticks fell right behind me. I wasn't apprehensive about this at first, as I just assumed it was some squirrels or some birds running around. It could be chipmunks throwing things at me, who knows, there's plenty of things in the trees. This happened to me before in the past. I finished my breakfast without incident and kept walking toward the summit. This was early in the morning around 6am, so there would be a lot of birds chirping and a lot of other activity going on, but things felt like they were getting quieter and quieter as I ascended. 
This definitely creeped me out, but I tried to push it out of my mind because I had already been hiking for quite some time and was not going to turn around. Eventually, more sticks fell to my right, somewhat close to me, and they sounded heavier this time. These were the kind of small twigs that would generally fall from squirrel activity. I went over and checked them out, but these, these were substantial in size. This continued more frequently until I finally reached the trail's end. On my way back, it happened continuously, increasing its frequency as I descended, until suddenly it stopped when I was about a mile from the car. When I finally returned to my car, I found all of my doors opened, and it seemed like all of my stuff had been violently rummaged through. I had a bag in there with some of my clothes, which had been torn up and ripped to shreds. Many of my clothes were outside the car and leading back into the woods. I thought about calling the police, but I live in Philadelphia, so I knew nothing would happen. To this day, I still get freaked out when I think about it. I don't necessarily think it was connected, but I feel uneasy about these things happening at the same time. But then again, maybe I was just robbed. The Creature in the Mountains by Anonymous This took place last year at the beginning of summer. I was with my mom headed down to Nana's farm to visit for a weekend. For some context, she lives on a farm way back in the country, right at the foot of a mountain in rural South Carolina. It's a very rural, secluded area, so the roads are poorly maintained and barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another. The houses are also spread out and set far apart from the tree line from the road so there's very little ambient light beside a car's headlights. So my mom and I were driving along. We were roughly about 15 minutes away from my Nana's farm deep in the woods with the radio down, almost silent. It was around 11 p.m. at this point. We come on to this straight stretch of road in a heavily wooded area and suddenly this blur of a creature darts out across the street, right at the edge of our headlights. It was moving pretty fast, but my mom and I got a good look at it and agreed on what we saw. It was a reasonably large creature, roughly the size of a person or bigger. Neither of us could make out the head, but we both remember it appearing to have a segmented body. My mom's words, not mine. As if it were emaciated and its ribs were poking out. The reflection of the light made it hard for me to tell the color, but my mom said she remembered it being dark. She didn't see any fur or hair, had long, gangly limbs, and as it moved across the road, it didn't run the way a dog or a horse would with all four legs. The best word to describe it is that it was loping, using its front limbs to pull itself along and moving considerably fast. We both said something like, what the heck is that, as it crossed. Then as we got up to where it had crossed, I turned to look, and just as it reached the other side of the road and out of our headlights, and I swear my life, it stood up and ran on its hind legs. It was not like a dog rearing on its hind legs or something else. This thing was bipedal naturally. Immediately yelled that it had stood up and we both started getting nervous. I would have thought I was going insane if my mom had not seen it as well. My mom had always been a pretty level-headed and not superstitious person. But still she was very nervous and made me agree not to tell Nana about it to avoid scaring her. Which made me recognize how serious this potentially was. I should also mention that there has been a series of attacks on livestock and horses around this time. People said they found wire fences ripped through and their animals attack. I don't know if they died, but if I remember correctly, a few horses were severely wounded. There have been a few other strange instances in the area, but that was my experience personally. Hi, Swamp Dweller. I've been listening to your stories for about a month now, and I want to say you are my favorite narrator I have encountered thus far. I always think the stories you tell are fascinating and they've got me thinking about things that I experienced myself. I am 18 years old and I live in the Netherlands, so do not expect a Bigfoot, Dogman, or any kind of cryptid story. The forests here are just way too small and the population density is too high to have such creatures lurking about in the woods. But, as probably many of you know, that does not mean that weird things do not occur. With that having been said, let me tell my two stories that still make me ponder sometimes. When I was about 13 or 14 years old, 
A new kid joined my class and became a member of my group of friends who I still see regularly. I will call him Brent to make things easier. Brent lives at the border of the biggest patch of woods in the vicinity of my house, which has an area of about 35 square kilometers, or 13.6 squared miles for the American full. His family has a respectable piece of land for Dutch standards and has an extra building on the land which is used for office and guest stuff. Next to his land was an abandoned property which consisted of four small buildings of which two were inaccessible. Well, Brent, my friends, and I, being young teens, often went to this property and hung about the place, smashing windows and blowing up toilets and other stuff with fireworks. This eventually grew out to us having a sleepover in the guest house about once a year, during which we would wait until midnight to venture out into those woods. The abandoned property, other towns or sometimes all of them until the sun came up. We would occasionally build and throw Molotov cocktails in the concrete shed of the abandoned property, set off heavy fireworks, and one time even blew up 15 liters of lighter fluid on the sandy plains of the woods. These woods were mainly coniferous, and, for whatever reason, sometimes had these sandy plains ranging from small to huge within them. We liked one plain because it was about three miles away from the house, and sand doesn't burn so we were confident enough to set up fireworks there and not cause a forest fire. This annual night got a name which roughly translates to Chaos Night. Childish, I know. One chaos night, there were only three of us because the rest of the boys had family things to attend to, because it was roughly around Christmas and New Year's Eve. That night was freezing cold, and we went out to walk to the sandy plain in the woods about 5 a.m. I remember it being so cold that the light yellow sand of the plain was frozen and glistening under the sky. During the walk there, however, something strange happened. We were walking single file. Brent in the middle, another friend called Steve in the front, and me in the back. When we were almost at our destination, whilst we were talking, I heard the whispers or mumble of a woman. Just about three to five yards away, directly to my right. Brent and I stopped dead in our tracks because we have never heard something like that before. Brent often walks his dogs in the late evenings through those woods, and I have had enough adventures out here with my grandpa at night in the forest to know the common sounds of the Dutch critters as well. Steve has trouble hearing higher pitched sounds and was a bit further away from where the sound came from, so he didn't notice it. But Brent spun around and we both looked at each other confirming that we both heard it. We stood there for a bit, told Steve what we were hearing, and I shined my flashlight in the direction of the sound but never saw anything. This made us shrug it off and continue our little adventure. This might not sound scary at all, but you have to take some facts into consideration. Animals of the woods are extremely shy here, and will run off if they hear you coming, and we were plenty loud. Also, the other animals that would be active on the ground at that time, and maybe would let us come that close would be a moose, or maybe a rat or something. But I can assure you this, this sounded way too human. Brent even agrees with me that it sounded like a woman. So, either there was someone hiding from us, or it was something else entirely. The thought of my experience and what it could have been still gives me chills to think about, especially now that I'm a firm believer of the unknown. My second story takes place at Brent's house. This was after our first night of chaos. My friends and I went out to the abandoned property to throw Molotovs again, because the night before was our first time doing a thing like that, and let's just say... A lot of the Molotovs failed. Earlier, I said that we would throw the Mollies in a concrete shed for safety reasons. Yes, we were scoundrels, and pretty stupid one. The shed was placed about 10 meters away from the other three buildings that were built in a sort of circle. So during the night, we had not gone to the three main buildings because the shed was the first thing you would encounter from the way that we had to come. Therefore, we discovered weird symbols painted in red all over the walls of the three main buildings the day after. There certainly was a theme going on because most of them depicted a triangle with an eye that shed a tear in it. The other symbols that were there kind of reminded me of those patterns in cornfields. Me and a friend, Vincent, 
went into the only main small house, which was the only building besides the shed that was accessible. The rest had collapsed some years prior. We noticed that some furniture had been moved around, rather recently, and we were now able to climb up to the attic. Like I said, it was a small house, so we did just that. Vincent went first, and I followed. He found like this casing that you put on the ceiling to cover up your light bulb. I do not know what it is called, but it resembled a globe and it was white. He was also showing it to the rest of my friends through the broken window while jokingly shouting, I found the eye of the Illuminati, referring to the triangle eye symbols outside. While he was doing this, for some reason, I had to take a pee. So, I went pee into this hole that was going into the ground. When I was done, I walked further into the attic, which consisted of two rooms, one in the front in which we entered and where Vincent found that weird eye thing. The room in the back was dark and only had one tiny window that was about 8 inches by 8 inches. To my surprise, there was this little filthy window there, also, that resembled an eye within a triangle painted in red. When my eyes adjusted to the dark, I saw that there was a circle painted on the floor with small candles on the outline of it. In the middle of the circle was a self-made morning star on the ground. For those of you who do not know what a morning star is, it is a medieval weapon which consists of a handle with a chain on the far end of it and a ball with spikes protruding out of it. I picked up the weapon and brought it to the window where Vincent was still talking with my friends outside and immediately after I stuck my hand out of the window to show it to everybody, Vincent threw the eye high up in the air and it landed literally on one of the rocks, breaking it into a thousand pieces. Vincent's comedy act caused me and the boys to laugh and therefore we weren't that impressed by all of it. Sure, we were perplexed that something like that would even be there, but not necessarily terrified. After that we threw some mollies and took the Morning Star back to Brent's house where he stashed it somewhere. That abandoned property has since been demolished and other people have built their houses there and the Morning Star should still be somewhere in Brent's house, although I haven't seen it since that day. We still go into those woods at night sometimes, and we've had a couple of weird things happen again. If someone wants to know more or even see some pictures of the Morning Star and symbols, maybe I can send them in. Although these stories may not seem scary on their own, together these experiences creep the hell out of me and often make me wonder what was in those woods that night and who left that Morning Star there and why. If someone has a clue, please leave it in the comments. Thank you for listening and stay safe. Hello Swamp Dweller, I've sent in a few stories in the past, going under a different alias, speaking about my creepy experience with camping a few years ago. But around a week ago, I had another very strange thing happen to me. I'm 14 years old and from Belfast, Ireland. I go out a lot on nighttime walks with my friends, and most nights we only go on short ones. But this night we planned on doing something else. I met my friend on her street and then we went and picked up my other friend. For the story, I'll call one Katie and the other one Ellie. We walked to the bus stop closest to my friend's street and got a bus to the university area of my city. As there are lots of cafes and restaurants around there, and it's quite bright. We got off the bus at the stop and started walking, looking for a cafe to go into, but we couldn't find one, so we decided to walk straight into the city center, which was a short walk away. We found an open cafe and decided to go in for a snack and something to drink. It was around 7pm and it was getting dark outside, so we decided to leave the cafe and get another bus back home. We got on the bus that would take all three of us home, but at the second stop a ticket inspector got on and kicked us off the bus when he realized we had no tickets. It was now raining slightly. We decided we would just walk to another bus stop and get on a bus that we knew would be inspector free. We walked around 5 minutes to get to that bus stop, and when we got there, there wasn't another one around for about 20 minutes. Damn it, let's just take the other bus to the field and then walk through it to get home, I said to both of my friends. They agreed, so we hopped on the bus and took a seat. On the bus ride back, it started to rain even heavier. When we got to the last stop, we were the last ones on the bus, and the stop happened to be in a very Protestant area. so. We already felt quite unsafe being there, 
as two out of three of us had very unique Catholic names and were afraid of some people hearing them and potentially harming us. I know it might sound a little weird to mention this, but unfortunately it is a true issue in the area we grew up in. We walked through some streets and finally got to the football field that backed onto the forest that we would need to cut through to get home. We sprinted across the football field, trying not to get our shoes too wet, as it had been raining for a few days, and the field happened to be quite flooded. We got to the edge of the forest, and when the rain got a little bit heavier than it was before, the forest was pitch black, so we turned on our flashlights to see where we were going. We began our walk into the forest, taking careful steps as to not slip on the wet, muddy ground. Now I spent my whole summer in that forest, and I would be confident in saying that I knew it like the back of my hand. All three of us do. When you walk in, there's a straight path that leads you through two small fence posts after walking for about two minutes. When you get past those fence posts, you take a right and walk for about two minutes. Then you arrive at the other side of the forest, where you exit into a huge field, which then leads you home. Although, when we took a right at the two tall fence posts, it didn't lead us there at all. The whole forest changed shape. We had been walking down this path for around five minutes now, and the rain was so loud we could hardly hear each other. This was when we started to panic. We were running around now, trying desperately to find the way out of this place. We walked up a small hill to a big tree, a tree that we had never seen before, a tree that was not there before, ever. I looked around to see my friend Katie as pale as I had ever seen her before. What do we do now? She screamed. I shouted back to her that I didn't know. Then her flashlight flickered. An iPhone flashlight. Phone flashlights never do that. Then, mine went out. I started to panic as it was now so dark you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. Then, just after that happened, my friend Katie got a call from my friend Ellie's twin sister who happened to not be there that night. Katie spoke to her in a panic, but this only lasted a few seconds as her phone randomly hung up on her. Out of the blue, it hung up all by itself and died. Weird. It was fully charged. We continued our walkthrough, still trying to find our way back. After taking multiple turns that we had never seen before, we finally reached the clearing that we had been looking for. It felt like hours of walking, and there's no telling how long it actually took. We stopped for a minute or two to calm down, when, from behind us, I heard twigs cracking, almost as if there was someone walking in circles around us. I told my friends we had to leave immediately, trying not to panic them. We got to the bottom of the field we had ended up in, and I checked the time. It was 8.45, but we arrived at the start of the forest at 8.39. There is not a chance in hell that that whole thing only lasted for five minutes. It felt like... All three of us had been there for an hour minimum, but it was only five or six minutes. I got home and couldn't stop shaking the entire night. What just happened? Why did it feel like such a long time? Why did the flashlights flicker and then go out? Why did the forest change shape completely? Why did my friend's phone hang up? And lastly, why did I hear someone circling us in the clearing? We have all agreed to never go there in the dark, unless we are with a large group of people. If anyone has any idea what this could have been, or what we could have experienced, please feel free to inform us in the comments down below. I moved from Idaho to Alaska about two months ago and already I have experienced something I never thought I would ever experience. After taking a week to recover from a five-day trek across Canada on the Alaska Highway, I decided I was going to get out and explore the wilderness of my new home state and try to catch a glimpse of the wildlife such as moose and bears. The house I am renting is on the outskirts of the nearest town, so I basically live right in the middle of the forest and have access to miles of dense woods. I still don't know what I had been thinking when I decided to go into the woods without anything but my phone, which at the time didn't get much service in Alaska, and some earbuds. I began running at a medium pace into the woods hopping over bushes and branches while jamming out to some shaky graves. I had probably gone through about five songs when my shoelace got hooked on a fallen tree and I was thrown to the ground face first. I immediately got back up, swore out of irritation, and began to put my earbuds back in when I realized I had no idea where I was. 
At some point, I had lost my sense of direction and had only but a faint idea as to which direction I had came from. I started to run the way I thought I had came from when I began to panic and second-guess myself, when I realized I should have come out into my backyard ages ago. I didn't want to panic because I knew that it would make everything worse. Panicking never helps. I started to try and pinpoint the right direction. Of course, I eventually realized that I was hopelessly and utterly lost without the slightest indication of which way would bring me to some sort of civilization. After a few brief moments of cursing and groaning, I decided I would follow my gut and go in the direction I thought would possibly lead me home. I started running at full speed, hoping to break the tree line in a matter of minutes when something on the ground caught my eye. It was a backpack. I stopped instantly and looked around for a person or a campsite, but there was nothing I could see from the spot I was at, which, which was situated at the bottom of a small hill. The bag looked as if it had been abandoned for quite a few days at least, but was slightly damp from the rain earlier that morning. I kneeled and picked the bag up, resting it against my knees. It had a heavy weight to it when I moved it, so I knew there was something inside. Looking back now, I remember the dark feeling I got in my chest right before I unzipped the main part of the backpack. Inside, there were bags of what I immediately knew were some sort of assortment of illegal drugs and items used to administer them. I quickly stood up and took a step back. I had such a powerful feeling of dread that I felt like I was in imminent danger. I just wanted to get out of there and find my way home, so I started running again to the top of the hill. I was hit with a wave of excitement when I saw a house at the bottom that was buried in the trees. I had begun to start to make my way for it when something told me to stop inside my head. It crept into my mind that what I had just discovered was awfully close to this house. I wanted so badly to be out of the woods and find some form of civilization, but something told me that I just wasn't safe out here. I ran away from the house along the tree line hoping that I would possibly stumble upon another house. After about 10 to 15 minutes, I stumbled into a neighborhood of sorts and asked a man working in his yard for directions. He was kind enough to drive me home and assure me everybody gets lost in Alaska at some point. As soon as I got home, I showered and chugged some water, then immediately called the police to report what I had seen. However, since I had no idea where I was, I couldn't tell them where to find the drugs or where the house was, so my report was basically useless. I, I just felt so guilty if I hadn't at least said something. I've driven all over the area down different roads trying to find that house, but I never have. It's probably for the best though because I don't want to get caught up in something I shouldn't be in. I'm glad I listened to my gut that day and kept running from that house because people in possession of such many illegal drugs can be extremely dangerous. And I'm just glad I didn't die out there when I got lost. It was mid-late August 2016 and we had just closed on the purchase of one and a half story log cabin bordering the Washita National Forest. This was a property with about 15 wooded acres, two ponds, and a wet weather creek. I had fallen in love with the area on the drive to see the property. Driving along the winding mountain highways, I couldn't imagine anything more beautiful to look at than the tree-covered mountaintops. What I saw as a rolling sea of trees was a welcome distraction from the shoulderless edges that dropped off into the dark, creepy rocky woods below. The air felt different. It was lighter and easier to breathe. I was ready to begin unloading things as soon as we signed the papers to the close, and we were handed the keys. After unloading some of my things, my eight-year-old son and I were back on the road to load up more things and then drive back up. As a boy, he had family reunions nearby at Robber's Cave. Once we arrived, it was already late in the evening. Due to our very long drive, we were all ready to call it a night. My father passed out in an oversized quilted hammock in the living room, and my son and I had a queen-sized air mattress in the master bedroom upstairs. We had not been in the bed very long before I heard what I presumed to be some unusual birds making a hooting-type sound. There were three distinct vocalizations, and oddly enough, only one of them sounded masculine. I considered the sound and wondered what kind of bird it could be, and why it was so loud at this late hour. Soon I heard little things hitting the glass. It sounded like it could have been a swarm of bugs flying into the reflection on the uncovered window and sliding glass door to the back deck. It continued, and it seemed excessive. 
I looked and saw little twigs and pebbles hitting the back after bouncing off the glass. I heard something rather large come off the tree line before the cabin. I heard branches breaking and leaves rustling. It sounded like something was making a beeline for the house. I kept hearing thuds and I believed a large rocks were being tossed or pounded on the ground. It was so unexpected, but I thought there were many animals accustomed to the property being vacant. It could be a black bear. However, I then heard the knocking sounds. It was unmistakably the sound of a piece of wood being used to knock on a tree. At this point, all I could think was Bigfoot. There was a heavy downpour that came down at 11.30 p.m. There could have been lightning and thunder, but I really didn't notice. This was such a heavy rain, and I couldn't be certain if these things were still out there. The noise seemed to have stopped. I didn't even attempt to sleep because I was thinking so many thoughts about what had just taken place, and I never actually believed the Bigfoot stories on TV. Did Bigfoot knock on the trees? That always seemed so far-fetched to me. Did Bigfoot make weird hoot and holler sounds? What on earth was making those noises anyway? Finally, the rain had stopped and it still seemed rather peaceful. Of course, it wasn't long before the branches breaking and trees splitting sound began. I heard what I believed were rocks. This is a mountain. The very loud and aggressive knock 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 sound on the tree in front of my cabin below was what really set me in motion. These were followed by big, exploding sounds. It sounded like something was now whacking something against the cabin wall below. It shook the cabin and I believed it to be very threatening. Naturally, I woke my son up and took him to a room where I felt he would be safer. I didn't trust the sighting glass door and I didn't know why I think the flimsy office door was safer. Just being out of sight just made us feel better, I guess. I turned on the deck light in the front and back porch lights. I opened the upstairs office window and yelled out, Leave us alone! We're trying to sleep! I checked all the windows and opened slightly to listen, and all was quiet, except my son who was complaining that I woke him up at 4am. My dad woke up to me checking all the windows and talking to my son. My dad was upset that I didn't wake him. At daylight, he insisted we go out and walk around the cabin looking for evidence of this wild report. I didn't see all the broken branches or big rocks, though I did notice later three trees in the front yard were definitely split in two, and it wasn't by anything natural. The tree trunk was easily eight centimeters around. My father is one of the ones who found the footprints, which I have never ever seen in my life. They were pressed into the mud through the fallen yellow and brown leaves, they were three very large human-like footprints. There were no claws or nail impressions. There was also an ape, like juvenile-sized handprint. These prints were going up to the stone walkway leading up to my covered wraparound porch. My dad insisted that it must be a black bear, but I'm not sure. As I share this, I'm still wondering what made those noises that night. Sometimes I think it's a Bigfoot. It sounds a lot like proper Bigfoot etiquette. But at the same time, I have no idea what this mysterious beast was, or what it possibly could have wanted. I am a 30-year-old man living in central Pennsylvania. If you've never been here, it's a lot of thick woods with small towns miles apart. This story takes place on my friend's land. We will call him John. He is a former army soldier whose family owns a lot of land, which we would camp on, hike on, and do whatever we wanted. I, John, and our friend Dan, who is a proud jarhead, got our girls, gear, and beer, and headed up the mountain on three ATVs for a fun night. All seemed normal when we got to our spot, a somewhat sparse, flat area where the trees weren't too thick. We set up our tents and a fire, before leaving the two girls to chat while we went down to do some shooting a little way away. Now you should know when we shoot, we get really into it. None of that flat range stuff, we're like gun tubers, but only good. We have plate carriers, rifles, pistols, cases of ammo, the works. John even bought himself a pair of old crappy NODs to mess around with. The older kind that need a lot of light and only give you a blurry green shape. We loaded our guns set up steel plates and makeshift barriers and practice for a few hours, only stopping to eat. We eventually went back to camp and sat with the other girls to cook dinner, drink, and have a laugh. We joked that the meat would attract wolves. Now, 
One odd thing we do, which I'm very thankful for, is we set up sand-filled cans tied to wires in a circle around our camp, an old hunting trick we learned as kids. If something were to trip this wire, the cans would cling together. This will be important later. As the moon came up and the fall chill began to set in, the lighthearted mood died. It was around midnight when we all began to feel a bit odd. We tried to chalk it up to how oddly quiet the forest was. It felt like we were being watched from all directions. One of the girls mentioned she heard something moving in the woods nearby. We sat and listened intently. We all looked toward the sound that we heard a second later, but by this point, anything even seven feet outside the camp was pitch black. Eventually, this shuffling noise became an almost running sound, if that makes any sense. Like someone circling our camp quickly, messing with us. If you've been in the woods long enough, you can tell the difference between two and four feet. Dan stands up and shouts, Dude, are you really trying to screw around? This is private property. We will kill you if we have to. Don't be stupid. We shined our flashlight into the tree line and saw nothing. The movement continued, followed by what we thought was the sound of a blade scraping along bark. We sent the girls into the tents with a pistol and grabbed our rifles. Whatever this was moved so fast we could not pinpoint it. We each had our backs to the fire, and each other had our guns up, scanning the area in front of us. Dude, John, NODs, put on your NODs. John put them on, and after a minute or so, he opened up fire into the tree line followed by a piercing pained yelp or grunt. What do you see, man? Guns up, he said. What do you see? He just kept yelling to have our guns up. For the next five or so hours, we stood around the fire, the girls tossing us jerky, energy drinks, and adding wood to the flame. Anything to keep us awake. To be honest, I'm surprised my heart didn't explode. We would occasionally fire shots blindly into the wood line, hoping to at least scare it off. After a while, the can stopped rattling, but we still hear running and huffing as if this thing was stopping and watching us, then trying another spot over and over, looking for an inn. For just a few brief moments, it got close enough to the fire, and I swear I saw black fur. At first light on the verge of collapse, we all jumped on the ATVs and hauled ass back to John's house, where we passed out in his living room. The next day, Dan and I, with another friend, took two ATVs and went back for our stuff. After unsuccessfully getting any info from John about what he saw and refusing to come with us, we found the tents shredded and the coolers knocked over. The perimeter string was cut down and there were several bullet holes. We tried to find the spot John first saw the creature. He believes he winged it. He found what appeared to be black fur stuck to a tree with blood, about six and a half feet up, and what appeared to be large claw marks on a few others. John became something of a shut-in after that. He still hangs around, but isn't the same. We made two trips armed, grabbed what we could, and never went back to that area in the woods. I'm 14 years old and from Belfast, Ireland. I go out on a lot of nighttime walks with my friends, and most nights we usually go on short ones, but this night we had planned to do something else. I met my friend on her street, and then we went and picked up my other friend. For the story, I will call one Katie and the other Eli. We walked to the bus stop closest to our friend's house, and I got a bus to the university area of my city, as there are a lot of cafes and restaurants around there, and it's quite brightly lit. We got off the bus at the stop and started walking, looking for a cafe to go into. But we couldn't find one, so we decided to walk straight into the city center which is only a short walk away. We found an open cafe and decided to go in for a snack and something to drink. It was only around 7 p.m. and it was getting quite dark already, so we decided to leave the cafe and get another bus back home. We got on the bus that would take us all home, but at the second stop, a ticket inspector got on and kicked us off when he realized we did not have any tickets and snuck on. It was now raining lightly and we decided we would just walk to another bus stop and get on a bus we knew the inspector would not be on. We walked around five minutes to get to that bus stop, and when we got there, there wasn't another one for around 20 minutes. Damn it, let's just get to the other bus stop going through the field over there and walk through it to get home. I said to both of my friends. They agreed, so we hopped on the bus and took a seat. On the bus ride back, it started to rain heavier. 
When we got to the last stop, we were the last ones on the bus, and the stop happened to be in a very Protestant area. So we already felt quite unsafe being there, since most of us had quite unique Catholic names, and there had been a lot of, uh, I guess you could even say gang violence between the two religions in this time. So we were a little nervous to be in an area that technically we weren't supposed to be in. We walked through some streets and finally got to the football field that backed into the forest that we would need to cut through to get home. We sprinted across the football field trying not to get our shoes wet as it had been raining for a few days, and the field happened to be quite flooded. We got to the edge of the forest, and when the rain got a lot heavier than it was before, the forest was pitch black, so we turned on our flashlights to see where we were going. We began our walk into the forest, taking careful steps as to not slip on the wet, muddy ground. Now, I spent my whole summer in that forest, and I would be confident in saying that I knew it like the back of my hand. All three of us do. When you walk in, there's a straight path that leads you through two tall fence posts after walking for about two minutes. When you get past those fence posts, you take a right and walk for another two minutes. When you arrive at the other side of the forest, where you exit into a huge field, which leads us home. Although, when we took a right at the two tall fence posts, it didn't lead us there at all. The whole forest changed shape. We had been walking down this path for around five minutes now and the rain was so loud we could hardly hear each other. This was when we started to panic. We were running around now, trying desperately to find a way out of this place. We walked up a small hill to a big tree, a tree that we had never seen before, a tree that was definitely not there before, ever. I looked around to see my friend Katie as pale as I had ever seen her before. What do we do now? She screamed. I shout back at her that I don't know. Then her flashlight flickered. An iPhone flashlight. Phone flashlights never do that. Then, mine went out. I started to panic as it was now so dark that we couldn't see our hands in front of our face. Then, just after what happened, my friend Katie got a call from our friend Eli's twin sister, who didn't happen to be there that night. Katie spoke to her in a panic, but this only lasted a few seconds as her phone randomly hung up on her and out of the blue, it just turned off. She still had more than half a battery left, which was incredibly weird. I've lived in this town all of my life. I know all the weird traditions that come with living in a place as remote as mine, but nothing explains what's happened at our deer park. I used to come out here most evenings during the pandemic park up by the base of the hill overlooking the sanctuary and just immerse myself in nature. I was always mindful of the distance I had to keep from the deer, particularly during mating season, and it wasn't like the deer didn't know what a car was. These were in their own reserve, sure, but the trail cut right through their vast fields, and they'd grown accustomed to seeing cars all manner of times in day and evening, which is what made the situation much more unsettling. Starting last week, a sign was put up on the entrance gate to the park. Impossible to miss as the car slowed and the tires rolled over the metal grates. With it being the late hours and very few cars on the road, I decided to stop and read it in full. A polite notice to our valued visitors entering the Oboro Nature Reserve. Our deer are exhibiting unusual behaviors, and we are politely requesting you observe the following guidelines in place as to best protect yourself and the well-being of our deer. 1. While the park is open 24 hours a day, we are recommending visitors do not stop their cars during observable grazing periods and on midsummer nights. You are welcome to drive through and observe from a distance, but please do not slow down or stop. 2. Should you be slowed or stopped at any other time and the deer be curious by your vehicle, act calmly and do not speed up. Let them inspect you and judge you as a safe passerby. If they begin snorting, that is your cue to leave. 3. There have been reports of deer standing on their hind legs and remaining idle in the fields. These rumors are a fallacy. Please do not pay attention to them. 4. There is a black stag that holds dominion over the western herd. His antlers are sharp and his stride is impressive, but do not attempt to approach him. Please pay him the respect you would normally and do not stare at any of the females in his harem. He will charge you. Bucks are not friendly. 5. Deer remember faces. 
They can recognize you from a distance and will verify your smell as you get closer, listening intently the entire time. There are many of them and only one of you. You would do well to mind that. 6. Lastly, no matter what salacious rumors have been propagating amongst the community, the deer are not congregating in the dead of night. Deer are social animals that sleep and graze together in a herd. This is normal. The deer are acting normally. Drive safely. Keep your doors locked and have a lovely drive in the Aboro Nature Reserve. Strange, right? The notice wasn't your usual steel sign with carefully embossed wording. Rather, it had been hastily marked up and nailed to the wall adjacent to the welcome sign, as if in a hurry. I'd not heard any sorts of rumors around town, and nobody had complained about the deer park at all. We're a population of maybe 2,000, so it's not very difficult for a word to get about. Still, I had my routine and intended to stick to it. Some of the info was valuable for newcomers. There was indeed a large buck who paraded the western herd. His name was Jojo, and I fully believed he would gore anyone who outstayed their welcome or got too close. Beautiful specimen of muscle and authority. He ensured his harem would never be straying too far from him, and he seemed to be borderline obsessive about making sure they never went across the eastern side where the large swaths of trees were at. In fact, I'd observed him on multiple occasions actively nudging or ramming younger males away from the split in the road and back to safety. On the rare occasion that a member of the herd crossed the line, he would refuse to acknowledge them and actively keep them away from entering back, as if they were banished. As I drove through the archway, I had realized I had not seen many deer in the eastern section of the park. Looking out my window and staring at the makeshift forest to my right and a burning question coming to the forefront of my mind that didn't leave as I reached the hill overlooking both sides of the hill. Where are the rest of the deer? It was, to say the least, unnerving to sit there and try to enact my ritual of riding under a clear night when there was a strict absence of the herd where they should be. I tried my best to focus, but something was just burning in my mind, pulling my eyes back to look at that same spot, time and time again. Eventually, I decided that I needed to get some fresh air and take a better look, satiate my curiosity, and then, with my mind at ease, I can get back to finishing my blog. The air is humid when I step outside. No breeze and the stars are out on full display. Thank goodness for no light pollution in the countryside. I leave the engine running and walk to the barrier my car is parked in front of, leaning over and taking a pair of binoculars I bring for slower days when I want to see the deer in better detail. As I direct my vision to the eastern herd, I see something darting in the tree line. It's quick, hairy, and seemed to move the second my binoculars motion toward it. Even a deer shouldn't be that spooked, especially from this distance. My joints seize up and I dang near drop the binoculars when I hear a familiar snorting from behind me. I turn and see Jojo, standing 15 feet from me, just by the rear of my car, and his eyes gleaming in my rear lights. His head is low, and his antlers are thick, sharp, and aimed at me. In that moment, I don't know if he was going to charge and whether I should be fighting for my life or not. Instead, I do as I was instructed and stay still, not making sudden movements as he snorts again, closing the gap between us slowly. As he gets within five feet of me, he rears his head up. I see the most baffling expression on his face for a fleeting moment. Fear. Something ripples through the eastern forest, and birds begin flying away in droves. Some of the deer herd in the western area are circling something, and Jojo immediately bounds down and out of sight to control the chaos. I waste no time getting in my car and driving down after them, keeping the doors locked, the windows open a crack, and my speed at a decent crawl. As I come along the embankment that connects to the road, I see Jojo running full sprint towards another deer. He knocks the rival over and contorts the body as it skids across the grass and falls into the trail just ahead of my car. I know I'm not supposed to, but I stop the car and wait. In a choice between breaking the rules and breaking my car, I choose the former any day. The western herd deer under Jojo's command are gathering behind him, making horrific shrieks of terror. Jojo strides up and bows his head again in front of the still contorted deer, 
antlers on full display and dripping with black blood. It was a clear threat. Do not come back here if you value your life. I started wondering how I'd safely get this deer out of the way, or if I could mount the grass on the other side and go around it, when I saw something horrific unfold in front of my eyes. The body twisted itself around, and the limbs snapped to reset themselves. The head still cracked at an ugly angle, bones sticking out of the sides as it got into its shaking legs. Then it screamed. It sounded as if its lungs were filled with blood, a horrible muted cry of anguish that backed up every other deer but Jojo. I don't know what was keeping this thing standing, but it let its head flop lazily around as it carefully backed away onto the eastern side of the reserve before bounding into the tree line, as if nothing were wrong. My rational mind chalked it up to the adrenaline and instinct to survive, but it was impossible to shake the feeling that something was entirely wrong. I carried on driving as soon as the deer was out of sight, not looking at Jojo or the others as I carried on down the trail. For the remaining few minutes, I felt unseen eyes staring intently at me until I crossed the threshold and back into civilization. I'd never been more grateful to see other humans. Or my bed. Something about the whole incident just took everything out of me. I was drained of all of my energy. As I slept that night, I dreamt that I was a deer alongside Jojo, frolicking in the herd and grazing peacefully. But as I cast my eyes upward to the sky, a bitter chill on the wind... I saw the moon bathed in an almost purple plume, a strange light cast onto the land and noises rustling from the woods opposite. I don't know how I knew this, but something in me instinctively knew we were not supposed to go there. I saw shapes begin to emerge from the trees and that same horrible shriek rang out again as I woke up in a sweat. I leaned forward to catch my breath and grab a glass of water. As I changed positions to reach for my nightstand, I swear I heard something running up the trail to my house. I was probably still half asleep, maybe just imagining it, but that didn't make it any more unnerving. I decided it would be best to drive out the next night and confront my concerns head on, take the bull by the horns, or the deer by the antlers. If I'm not going to sleep soundly, then I should use my time wisely and document what I'm seeing, maybe pass it to the rangers in the morning, right? When I drove back out there last night, the atmosphere was vastly different. A mist was enshrouding the trail and most of the deer on the western side were huddled together, shaking and staring intently at the other side of the nature reserve. I couldn't see Jojo anywhere. Strange, I thought. Alpha males patrol their herds dutifully. Why wasn't he here? I parked up at the usual spot, making sure he wasn't around. I pulled out my binoculars again and stared at the eastern area. The clouds beginning to part as the moon shone through. There was movement all along the tree line as shapes began emerging one by one. I think it took my mind a moment to process what I was seeing. I'd finally seen the deer on the eastern side. But they were wrong. Very, very wrong. Standing on their hind legs and taking confident, awkward steps, they marched out of the trees with their heads craned to the sky. All of them emitting that horrible sound like their heads were being held under water as they screamed. It reverberated in my ears and made my skin break out in goosebumps. There were dozens of them, maybe a couple of hundred. Some were dragging a structure with them, others hauling a writhing shape I couldn't quite see. They congregated in a small huddle, the center of which was obscured from my vision. I look over to Jojo's herd and saw the fear in their eyes, so many of them shaking with their teeth bared, a primal fear we humans have largely lost in the safety of being the dominant species but this night showed me we were not as powerful as we think we are. As the huddle broke away and began walking towards the edge of their field, I saw what they had been huddling around. Jojo. He was still alive but barely moving and breathing. His eyes glazed over. When he began to come to, he started shrieking like a fawn. It was unnerving. They dragged him to the structure, a primitive set of steps, and hollowed out a hole in its center, coated in a thick substance on the sides just large enough for Jojo to be thrown into. I watched these things, these not deer, use their front hooves to hoist him up into the hole, his screaming incessant the entire time. They stood around it, their necks cracked as they stared at the moon and shrieked. I looked up with them, wondering if what they sought was up there in the skies, a kind of primitive god for these creatures. I should have known better, of course. Whatever god these deers prayed to, 
It didn't reside up above. No, no, no. It lurked deep below. A low groan called out in response. It possessed the same blood-filled lungs these monstrosities had, and Jojo's deer huddled closer together at its roar. Jojo had stopped moving, his crying completely gone as the not deer fell silent and formed a circle around their altar, snorting in unison. It grew to a fever pitch before something began dragging Jojo from beneath, ripping at his limbs and pulling until a horrific squelch indicated the top had separated from the bottom. The hole spurted out blood and chunks of deer as the not deer celebrated, danced in the rain, and feasted on the pieces. One final roar rang out from the unseen creature. It shook the ground, and I felt my balance waver for just a moment, steadying myself on the car. I know I should have booked it out of there, but I was desperate to understand what I was seeing. Rationalizing that perhaps this was a bizarre art piece, maybe a protest from some sort of animal rights group or even a bunch of edgy satanic teens. But the rational voice in my head grew very, very quiet when I grabbed my binoculars to look again. Every single one of them were staring up at me, emotionless, black eyes fixated on my position. I didn't wait any longer. I drove out of there at a breakneck pace, not looking at either side of the park on my exit and near coming off the road with the lack of traction. As I got to the archway, my tire smashing against the grate, I'd inadvertently attracted the forest ranger on duty. He pulled me over and walked up to my window, a friendly smile on his face. You know there's a speed limit there for a reason, right, son? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I got a little spooked is all. I smiled back. Nerve shot to hell, he raised an eyebrow. You didn't break one of the rules now, did you? Oh, no, I kept to them. It's just, well, Jojo got attacked by the eastern deer, and I don't think he's doing well. It was just a shock to take in. I figured telling a half-troop would be best. Couldn't exactly say what I thought I'd really seen, could I? That so? Well, they make their choices carefully. We don't know much, but we do not want to interfere. This is how it's always been. Animals have strange practices. You get how it is. But so long as you didn't look at them and they didn't look at you, you're fine. Do you remember faces after all? Thanks for visiting. Drive safe. He smiled again and tipped his hat before walking off to his station. My blood ran cold. I couldn't get those words out of my head the entire drive home. But so long as they didn't look at you, you're fine. I've not stepped outside my house since that night. I live in a remote part of the village and while I enjoy my privacy, it's been a hotbed for strange noises and unsettling emotion. Everywhere I go in my home, I feel like I'm being watched by those same vacant eyes. What happens now? What happens to those they look at? I can't get their eyes out of my head. And I can't sleep. I can't sleep at all. This isn't going to end until I figure out what they want. I wish I had more for you. I wish I could tell you more. I wish I could tell you what the not deer were, what they prayed to, why they sacrificed, what the ranger knew. But there's so many unknowns that it makes my head spin. It's just like being deep in the woods. So many twists and turns you never know which is the right path and which is the path to death. You never know... What danger lurks behind every tree? I don't know what the deer are doing. I don't know what is going on at that park. But if you value your life, you'll stay far, far away from it. And whatever monster they're praying to. There's something wrong with the deer on our nature reserve. They started standing up. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true Deep Woods horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to smack that like button like it owes you money. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, it helps the channel grow its ever-expanding waters. Be sure to turn on notifications as well as I upload videos almost every single day on all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your Deep Woods experience at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. You can also submit them via reddit at r slash thedarkswamp. I'd love to see your story and share it with everyone here. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube Premium and still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, 
Apple Podcast, Stitcher Radio, Google Podcast, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting The Swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without you guys. Definitely be sure to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those good places outside of YouTube for updates. And definitely be on the lookout for new videos as I have plenty of new ones coming soon. I really appreciate y'all and I'll see you soon with another creepy episode.